All right, I'm going to start seconds early just because. Can someone close that back door? That's what Todd's been doing. You don't have to get up and do it. There's someone in the back of the room that can do it. Oh, she's leaving. OK. All right. So my name is John Wargo. I am I'm a principal analyst at Forrester Research. And the topic of today's conversation is Apache Cordova. And apparently, I wasn't very enticing in my, um, in my title. They asked me if I want to come present on the topic. I'm like, what do you want me to write about? What it is, what it does, and how you use it? They go, yeah, that's fine. So I made that my title. Um, I wasn't kidding when I said this is going to be kind of whirlwind because I took an hour presentation and scrunched it into 40 minutes, but there's a lot to it, and I know a lot, and so I just thought if you're interested to come, then I'll share a bunch of cool information with you. Uh, there's my agenda, okay? Everyone got that? So then uh, the first thing you might ask is, well, why is there a principal analyst from Forrester Research talking about Apache Cordova? Is it because Forrester really loves Apache Cordova? No, no, not so much. <laughs> But uh, every time I say Apache Cordova, Carlos is going to clap. So, uh, so look, just a little bit about me. I'm a professional software developer, as you can tell. I'm also a propeller head geek. Um, I've written six books on mobile development and one book on soccer refereeing. And then uh, until recently, I was a contributor to the Apache Cordova project. I, I guess technically I still am, um, but I just it's a question of time. Um, I haven't contributed code, but I contributed the docs, and then through my books, well, we'll talk about that. So um, the reason why I'm here is because I've written a few books. So I wrote the first book on BlackBerry development, and then I wrote, it wasn't the first book on PhoneGap, but it was the best-selling book on PhoneGap. Uh, the reason why I know that is because it was translated into Chinese as well as Korean. Okay? Unfortunately, this book is still available, and people are still buying it. I like the check I get every six months, but at the end of the day, this is about PhoneGap 2. Don't buy this book. Uh, I wrote Apache Cordova 3, which, 3 programming, which is pretty cool, API cookbook. And then my most recent book is Apache Cordova 4 programming. And so with Apache Cordova 4, I wasn't kidding about the parting gifts. With Apache Cordova 4 programming, this is 500 pages. The API cookbook is 300 pages. It's 800 pages on Apache Cordova. So that's why I'm here. I may or may not be an expert on Apache Cordova. And there's my soccer refereeing book. And I also, being an old developer, I'm an IBM Lotus Notes and Domino guy. And I wrote 22 articles for Lotus Notes and Developer magazine about how to, all the possible ways I could figure out how to mobilize Domino. And they published 18 of them in an anthology. So if you weren't convinced before that I'm a geek, now you know. So, so what is Apache Cordova? And, and this is from uh, the web page, essentially. It's an open source framework for building cross-platform mobile apps using HTML5. Actually, um, you can cross the word mobile off because it now supports, well, it supported Windows and, and uh, OS X for some time, right? So it started as a mobile-focused framework, but now it can kind of support anything, although the, the uh, OS X support disappeared. And it started back in 2008, um, something called iPhone Dev Camp by a company called Natobi. And they uh, built iOS, and then they quickly added Android and um, BlackBerry support. Basically, a bunch of geeks got together for a weekend, and they, they wanted a way to do cross-platform. And the easiest way they could figure out how to do it was just to use web and then have a native runtime for each. In 2011, they donated the project to the Apache, uh, Apache Foundation. Um, they, first, they called it Callback. So if you're a JavaScript developer, you know why. Then they called it Device Ready. And then they switched it to Cordova. Anyone have any idea why it's called Cordova? Anyone? Anyone for a prize? Except for Carlos. Anyone? No, no. So um, it's, the, it's the name of the street that Natobi was on in uh, Vancouver. And then so literally the next. Cordova, yeah. Well, it depends on how the Vancouverians say it. Vancouverians? How those people up north. So um, very quickly, literally, I think the next day, they donated, I'm sorry, Natobi got acquired by Adobe. And so um, really pretty interesting how, they, how well they support it. But ultimately, what I think happened was, at the time, IBM was a big uh, investor in Cordova, World Phone Gap at the time. And I think they had to donate it to Apache so that IBM and the other companies were comfortable with Adobe buying Natobi. That's how I see it. And then originally the plan was for Cordova, or PhoneGap is what it was called at the time, the plan was for it to make itself obsolete. So the idea is that we're going to build this interface that allows you to build web apps to talk to 
native APIs, but then once the browser has those capabilities, and they're all coming, they've all pretty much shown up over time, then Cordova is going to disappear on its own. Well, that didn't happen, and I can explain why in a few minutes. Was I okay about the energy level? Was I right about the level I give you? Okay. So what's interesting is that the smartphone industry is heavily involved in Apache Cordova. Okay, uh, pretty much everybody but Apple is involved. No, it's funny, but it's also sad at the same time, right? But um, so Adobe has 10 people or so. IBM has 10, 12 people working on it. Five? Well, they've been more before. Um, Google had a team of like six or seven people. So these companies have made investments. And then what's the most interesting thing for me, and I don't have it up here, but Intel has made a huge investment. They've created an entire toolkit for Cordova development, which is awesome. And then Microsoft, it just, I mean, you heard the keynote this morning that you know, Microsoft is involved in so many aspects of open source. They've built, the, as far as I'm concerned, the best tooling for Cordova for iOS and Android development. Microsoft. It's really cool. So let's talk about the geeky tech stuff. So I mentioned it's an open source framework, and basically what happens, and the reason why I'm kind of telling a story this way is I believe that a lot of people misunderstand Cordova. Okay, so when I tell you I build a web app and it runs in a native app, people believe weird things about what that means. So this, this is verbatim, Carlos will correct me if I'm wrong, but this is exactly how it works. You build your application in web technologies, you run some sort of packaging process that takes those web assets and builds them into a native app, and then out comes a native app. Now there's people that think that there's some sort of um, transpiling that happens, or somehow the, the web content is converted into native stuff. Absolutely not. The web app is running inside a native container. Nothing else. Okay? And you might say, well, big deal, right? Am I moving around too much for you? Um, you might say, big deal, because I have the browser, but basically what happens is the web view, is the, so the whole UI is comprised of maybe a, mainly a web view. That web content runs within the web view, and then Cordova does some interesting things to enable that web application access to native APIs. So in 1.3 minutes, that is exactly what Cordova is. So what's interesting is um, you, you monitor the dev list and you look on Stack Overview and people are like, you know, can I use this framework with Cordova? Can I use this framework? Yes. The answer is always yes, because it's a web view running HTML content. Okay? And then the next question people ask is, you know, what kind of UI capabilities does Cordova provide? The answer is none. It's simply a mechanism for web applications to run in a native container and for that web application to have access to native APIs. Okay? Okay? All right. Uh, what's interesting, too, is that the, um, the web view has been challenging over time, um, mainly because on some mobile devices, the, the web view is not the same browser as the browser, right? And then in the case of iOS, for a while there, Apple was deliberately lobotomizing the JavaScript rendering engine in the web view so that performance was automatically slower in the web view than it was in the browser. All of those things have been fixed. Okay, which is really good news. And then in the meantime, Intel created a project called Crosswalk. And Crosswalk is an embeddable web view that is compatible with older versions of Android. So if you're building a Cordova app and you want it to run on multiple Android devices, including older ones, use Crosswalk. And you can do that. And another thing that's cool, because all of this is cool, of course, but um, the development team, the Cordova team, has built or started implementing pluggable web views. So you can use the build-in web view, you can use Crosswalk. Uh, Carlos and I were talking this morning about they're looking at adding uh, the ability to do React Native through a plugin. So if you think flexibility in Cordova in the same sentence, you're doing really well. Okay, so uh, any compatible framework. There are some hybrid specific frameworks. Ionic is the one that Carlos is gonna talk about later, okay? But the industry is starting to respond and seeing this is a good way to do things. So basically, when the Cordova project started, the, a Cordova app was a web view, and then an, an API interface in JavaScript, and then a bridge that connected to native APIs. Okay? And I apologize if this is hard to read. I was expecting a bigger screen. Um, with Cordova 3, what they did was they completely replaced that. So basically, the Cordova container contains no functionality except that web view. And there's a couple little APIs like console and so on, but pretty much nothing, and what they've done instead is they've implemented a pluggable, a pluggable architecture for Cordova. 
So now what I do is I create a project, and then I only add the plugins for the native capabilities I want. And then the beauty of that is, is if I want some functionality that Cordova doesn't create for me, write a plugin. So if you remember a few minutes ago, I said that the Cordova project's purpose was to make itself obsolete. And I said that went away. Well, it went away because as the browser has added these native functionalities, like camera and geolocation and all that stuff, uh, the pluggable architecture of Cordova gives it longevity because if I have some weird API created and I don't want to do native development, I can do it in Cordova, just make my own plugin. All right, so from a tooling standpoint, what's interesting is two years ago when I first gave this presentation, uh, the answer was there's none. Well, two, three years ago. Um, Cordova has had an interesting history, but um, beginning with Cordova 3, they created the CLI, the command line interface. And so being an old guy, going from DOS to Windows and back to the command line has been kind of interesting, right? But ultimately, there's a set of command line utilities, there's two of them, Plugman and, and the CLI, that give you complete control over a Cordova project. And then in, you would use the CLI to create a project, manage plugins, manage the project, and then would, you would use the command line to build the project, or you can use the IDEs. You can use Android Studio for Android, uh, Xcode for iOS, and so on. Okay. And then there's also, is that in here? Yeah, third-party tools. So um, there weren't a lot of tools available in the past, but now the vendors have really stepped up, and you need to give these tools a look. So on the, on the Visual Studio side, with Visual Studio, you can create a, a Cordova project. It's a free plugin to Visual Studio, and it works, I think, with community version, so Visual Studio is free in that case as well. Create a new project, add an Android target, add an iOS target, add your plugins to it, and then when you debug, it would launch the Android emulator, do live JavaScript debugging through the Android emulator in Visual Studio. Yeah, it does. You're shaking your head. Yeah, no, it absolutely does. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. The coolest thing, and it was amazing at PhoneGap Day last year, where Microsoft came and presented on a MacBook, anyways, um, is that you can do live debugging of an iOS app through a Mac Macintosh. So you load a node module on the Mac, you give Visual Studio the IP address, and when you do a build for iOS, it opens the connection to that machine, passes the project files, invokes Xcode through the command line, builds the app, launches the emulator, or launches a physical device, and does live JavaScript debugging in Visual Studio. Can I have a hell yeah? Yeah, yeah. Did I mention it's free? And the company that's doing this is Microsoft. I'm impressed, super impressed. And then uh, my favorite tool of choice for web development, and it's becoming my favorite tool for Node development and Cordova development, is uh, WebStorm from JetBrains. It has built-in understanding Cordova and PhoneGap, and I think Ionic even. And so it, you do all your development, live debugging is really freaking cool. Uh, things like uh, AppGyver, <clears throat> which is, um, it's, I don't have much time. And then Gap Debug is a, a commercial debugging tool. It's free. It's really cool. And so the packaging process involves the native SDKs. So for platforms, so platforms that don't have native, like um, Firefox OS, for example, you just make a zip file with the web archive or the web content. But for the other ones, you need access to the native SDK. Okay. So if you're building an iOS app, you need a Macintosh. There's no getting around it. Don't ask. Don't ask me. Don't. Uh, don't ask me for any alternatives. You not gotta have a Mac. Okay. Um, anyways. Hope I didn't break that. But then um, one of the things that Adobe did was they created PhoneGap Build, which is a cloud-based build service for Cordova app, well, for PhoneGap apps. And I'll talk about the difference in a minute. So you can build in the cloud, but for those of you that are smart and, and went, wait, he's lying, you don't have to have a Mac. You do. You still have to have a Mac to make the signing certificate that the cloud needs to build in. So you have to have a Mac. I had, uh, well, never mind. Okay, so this is getting better over time. It's a lot better than it used to be. There's a table on the Cordova website that lists API support across multiple platforms. So as you can see, there's some pink areas where there's not full coverage. But in general, most of the APIs you want are supported on all the platforms. If there's a pink I there, which means incomplete, um, for a platform that you want to use, that's great. Download the code, fix it, submit it, and then that pink will go away.
Um, we get questions all the time about the app stores. Can I put my Cordova app in a web store? Yeah, absolutely, because it's a native app. So at native apps go on the app store. And it complies with Cordova's or uh, Apple's guidelines because it's a web app. Uh, there are platforms that allow you to replace the content in a Cordova app over the air. Um, the PhoneGap build has something called Hydrate, which is not supposed to be for production, but it allows you to publish a new version of the server and it gets deployed over the air to the device. Uh, I used to be product manager for the SAP mobile platform, the hybrid SDK, and it has a capability that allows you to do app update over the air. So um, it's really cool. You can build an app, deploy it, and then update the web content later without doing an app store update. Uh, that Apple has a problem with. All right, so I mentioned PhoneGap versus Cordova. Here's the difference. PhoneGap, while the initial name for this project, uh, PhoneGap today is a product from Adobe, and it's essentially a distribution of Cordova. Um, until recently, until about a year ago, the PhoneGap CLI was different than the Cordova CLI, which is really confusing because the documentation wasn't different. But um, that's kind of been fixed. So what they've done is they've, they've taken Cordova, they've added some extra special sauce to the CLI, they've added the build service, there's the developer app, there's something called PhoneGap Enterprise, there's a, just some add-ons um, that Adobe's done to kind of brand PhoneGap as its own. But essentially the two are interchangeable, in my mind. Are you okay with that? Is it in your mind the same thing? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I mentioned earlier that I have OCD. Um, I refer to it as Cordova because it is Cordova. The world kind of calls Cordova PhoneGap. So you'll, one of the reasons why this book isn't selling is because people are looking for PhoneGap books and they can't find this, which is why I have free copies here. Oh, and also Adobe offers uh, uh, enterprise support. So if you want to adopt PhoneGap Cordova for your mobile apps, then one of the ways to do it with support is to buy support from Adobe. All right, so let's talk about the anatomy of a Cordova app. Because um, this, again, this is something that is confusing for people. I answered a, a post on the Google Groups the other day where someone was asking about, I've got this Node server app I've built. How do I run it in Cordova? Well, well you can't, OK? Um, the way this works is, remember I said in that earlier picture that it's a web app running inside a native container. So to do a Cordova app, I build an index.html file. I package it into a native app, and ta-da, Cordova app. Is there anything Cordova-ish about this? Everybody say no. Yeah, no, there's not. It's just HTML. Oh, and by the way, um, I forgot to put this in the slides, but you can build a Cordova app that simply launches a remote web page in the container. There's a config that XML setting of the launch URL. I just put the URL there, and it'll pull down a remote website in the container. Apple doesn't like that either. They don't like much. Uh, they used to not approve it. I don't know if they'll still approve it. I worked with a bank. Well, Carlos is nodding his head, so I guess they will. But I worked with uh, Key Bank many years ago, and that's what they did. They built a native app that launched their website, and it got killed. So, All right, so this is Hello World 2. Uh, all this code is up on GitHub if you're interested. Um, GitHub slash John Wargo. So this is a simple Hello World 2. Basically, I've added, well, actually, no, I've, I've got uh, animated effects. What am I doing? Ta-da. So you add a script tag that launches Cordova.js. And then you add an onload event. Well, you don't have to do onload. There's other ways to do this. But basically, you want an event to fire. And so what I do is I create a, an, I add an event listener for device ready. And basically, when the device ready event has fired, the Cordova container has finished initializing, and the Cordova capabilities are available to the app. All right? So you can add the Cordova APIs, and you can run them through your JavaScript code, but if device ready is not fired, none of it works. And the Cordova app um, JavaScript errors, it fails silently. So you'll, yeah, you'll, you'll put all this code in. You'll forget to add the plugin for the, the, for the code, and it'll run, and nothing will happen. Yeah. I love that fail silently thing. Just love it. All right. And then um, Hello World 3. So this is a, a different version of the app. I've added this, um, this paragraph, calling it app info. And then in that onbody load event, 
I have access to the device API. So I've added the device plugin to the, to the app. And I, have, I can pull device.cordova, device.platform, device.model, and device.version. Those are examples of some of the APIs exposed. Okay? So as long as I run this code after device ready is fired, I will we'll be replacing the content in that paragraph tag with this. Do you believe me? OK, well, I'm going to show you anyways. So there it is. This is a really old screenshot. That's BlackBerry 10. And then here it is on their platform. OK, so that's just a super simple example of how you do this. Is there anything fancy? No, it's just JavaScript APIs. All right, so let's talk about these APIs. So originally when they did this, originally when they did this, um, they were custom APIs. So the camera API on Android was different than the camera API on iOS. Great. Um, and over time, they've, um, they've standardized it. They're trying, they used to try to um, standardize on the device, device API, um, W3C, DAP, device API, proto, anyways. They were trying to standardize around what the W3C was doing. In the meantime, they've kind of abandoned that. Um, but they have, oh, there you go, device APIs working group. Um, but now they're, supporting whatever APIs that seem to make sense, and then they deprecate them when the capabilities become available in the browser. And pretty much all of them are plugins now. Uh, there's a documentation that shows you all the APIs. And so for, just to give you an example to use something more sophisticated, in Android, if I wanted to, oh, no, sorry, here we go. So this is the process to create an, uh, to create an app. I open a terminal window, or I do it through some sort of IDE, I create my project, and then I add a plugin for the particular capability. So here I'm adding the camera plugin. Uh, this identifier, org.apache.cordova.camera, is changing, or maybe it has changed. Um, they moved to NPM for everything, and the, the plugin names are changing. And then basically, I make a single call, um, navigator.camera, I get picture, and I pass it some callback functions and so on. And that's basically how I invoke the camera. And then what happens on the native device varies based upon the native device. In general, the camera app opens. You take a picture, you approve the picture, and so on. Uh, there's a camera options object. It's a JSON object. It's JSON, not JSON. JSON, it's just a word JSON. It's a JSON object that you populate with different values that you can control that camera function when it's taken. OK? Uh, you don't want, there's a camera destination of a raw file format for the image. Don't ever use that because the JavaScript engine can't handle the, the, the capacity of that image file as raw data. So, and then basically, it, you, here's an app that takes a picture, it brings up the camera app, you take it, and then you either retake or pick it. And then in this case, I pass back a file URL to the, to the app, and then I can do whatever I want with it. Make sense? OK. So to install it, basically you need one or more mobile development environments on your workstation, unless you're going to use PhoneGap Build, in which case you just need um, whatever you need to make the certificates. Um, it used to require Git. I don't think it requires, requires Git as much, but who doesn't need Git on their machines? Uh, you install Node.js, and then you run npm install Cordova, or you run npm install PhoneGap, and a few minutes later, you're done. And then basically, here's how you create a new project. It's kind of hard to see, but basically I did Cordova create lunch menu. And I passed it a couple different parameters. So it created the project. And what it does is it creates a project folder. And then I CD to that project folder. And then I add platforms. So in this case, I've added Android and Windows, I think. So I do Cordova platform add Android space iOS space Windows. And it'll create a separate folder for each of those targets and then populate with the appropriate project information. I'll show you this in a minute. And then I add plugins. So here I'm adding the device plugin, which gives me access to that device API. Cordova plugin add. And then I added the dialogues, which is dialogues. And then uh, the console, which really isn't needed for many platforms because the console is built in natively. And that's it. And when I get done, basically what I have is this project folder here. So there's a config XML file that uh, has specific information about the project. And then the www folder has basically an HTML5 application project. 
There's an index.html, there's a separate folder for JavaScript, CSS, and so on. What, traditionally what you do is you whack this stuff and replace it with your own thing or you just open this up and go. So if I go uh, here, here's my config XML. It's based upon the widget specification and the Cordova team has been fighting for years about diverging from that, but they're trying to stick with it as much as possible. So you define, here's where you define, I'm trying to do this with my glasses. There's a, I can't find it. There's a way where you specify this star here, uh, source equals index.html. If you replace this with an external URL, then when the app launches, it'll go out to the web and pull that page in and render it. And there's stuff around um, how to manage intents, how to um, handle whitelisting, all that stuff. It's, I'm not gonna go in there. We could go in for hours. Uh, the HTML is just, a, this is a boilerplate app that they include, but it's a standard, it's just standard stuff. Oops. All right. So, all right. So if you go out in the wild and look around, uh, the PhoneGap website has a database of a bunch of different apps out there that have been built with it. Um, ultimately, because of the robustness of the JavaScript engine and the robustness of the third-party HTML frameworks, my personal opinion is you kind of can't tell whether it's a native app or a web app, okay? Um, you can probably tell, but at the end of the day, who cares, right? Can I, can I engage with my end user the way I want to in a way that makes them interested in still using my app? Yeah, okay, so it works. Uh, ooh, I'm just trying to figure out my time here. I finished up early. Is there anything else I wanna say? Yeah, we're good there. All right, so there's a bunch of resources available to you. Um, the, you can access, it's actually cordova.io is a quick way to get there. It's the Cordova website. The, the reason why I wrote that first blue book was because I taught myself Cordova and I realized that the documentation was horrible. And um, it's gotten much, much better. It's really a lot more robust than it was. So I wouldn't worry about the docs, it's all pretty much there. Um, the, there used to be, uh, Cordova support was done at Google Groups. And what's interesting was there was a, Cordova support area, and there was a phone gap build, or there was a phone gap support area and a phone gap build support area, and people kind of blurred the lines and it got really ugly. But about a year and a half ago, two years ago, they just pointed people at Stack Overflow. So Stack Overflow has an IMAC categorization of Cordova and phone gap, so they all kind of group together. Um, you'll find me there when I'm bored or drunk and I got nothing else to do. Uh, the dev list is really interesting. That's where Carlos hangs out. I used to hang out there, but now I got a job that consumes all of my time. Um, that's where the development team discusses everything is Cordova. Do not hop on there and ask questions about how to code Cordova. Um, you, two things are gonna happen. Either you'll get ignored or you'll get flamed, one of the two, and you never know. It depends on who's on. <laughs> well, one of the things I was gonna say, what's interesting was I used to have a slide in here that called Cordova the fastest moving open source project on the planet because they run a monthly cadence. They were doing a monthly release as a Cordova. It was really pretty amazing. So they would do version three and then a month later, 3.1, 3.2. It was really pretty amazing. Um, but they discovered that they had, were not really following the Apache way and so they've, they've slowed down dramatically. <laughs> Carlos is laughing, that's an understatement. Um, but they, so it used to be that Cordova was a unified package of stuff. So when I downloaded Cordova, and it's been since version three that you could really download a version, but if I downloaded a version and extracted it in a folder, I had everything. So I had the container, I had the libraries, I had the tools, I had everything. Well, when they went to the CLI and everything became modules, and what's interesting is the first the modules were in Git, and then they moved here, and then they moved here, and so they've done a lot of changes in the way they do things, but ultimately they've disconnected all of the parts. So the CLI is released on its own schedule, the core um, platform specific stuff, so Android, iOS, and so on, is a, on its own release strategy, and then the plugins are on the own. So it's dynamic as heck. And the coolest thing was, just weeks after releasing Cordova 4 programming, the book behind me, they released version five. Weeks. But what's interesting was they released version five of the CLI. The core code for Android, for example, is still at four. So anyways, so there's this whole issue around how do I know what version I have, and there's things they're doing to manage uh, dependencies and so on, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't lose a lot of sleep over it. 
know, at the end of the day, it's HTML running a native container, and you just deal with your plugins. Uh, if you find a problem, um, submit it as a ticket in Jira. Okay, so if you if you find a bug, then just don't don't complain about it and don't wait for them to fix it. Tell them about it, and then then again, then as soon as you tell them about it, then download the code, fix it, submit the change, and then we'll all be good. Well, I, so I used to work with this team that we we created a set of plugins for Cordova, and we would constantly run up against issues that we that weren't fixed. We found bugs, and then the developer just sit back and fold his arms. No, 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 no. Fix it, fix it, and submit it. That's the world we live in. Um, I don't know if you can see this or not, but there are excellent Cordova books available at johnwargobooks.com. All right. Um, one, of the cool, <laughs> one of the coolest experiences for me has been PhoneGap Day. Um, so the, Cordova, the, the core Cordova guys are from Vancouver. And apparently, they really like beer. Am I right, Carlos? Carlos is not his set. Yeah, they really like beer. So if you attend Phone Gap Day, uh, everyone rushes through the morning presentation so they can start serving beer earlier. And so the beer comes out about 11.30 or so. But anyways, so it's, uh, Phone Gap Day is a one-day conference. A lot of the Cordova committers are there. A lot of the corporate sponsors are there as well. And there's just basically a day-long presentation of, of different cool things people do in Cordova. So last year, last couple years it's been in San Francisco. They've done one in Europe as well. This year, I'm sorry, they didn't have one this year. Uh, this year's event is next year, it's in Utah. So apparently everyone's going skiing. Um, what's interesting is when I went, was it, it, was, it wasn't last year, it was two years ago. It, I, the, I, it was the drunkest presenter I've ever seen in my entire life. If you go to johnwargo.com and, and search for drunk phone gap day presenter, you'll, you can see, you can watch the presentation, but it, it, I have never, ever seen a less professional presentation done at a conference. So it's, it's worth watching. Um, the other thing, there's a, a woman by the name of Liza Danger Gardner. She's one of the authors of the mobile first book on HTML5. And she did a presentation on how to craft a Cordova app that's spot on, beautiful. It's absolutely wonderful. It's super fast, so you're gonna have to watch it twice to figure it out. But she just talks about her mental progression that she went through when she decided to take an app and put it in Cordova. And it's really, it was fascinating. Liza Danger, yes, her middle name is Danger um, Gardner. And then I just added this today. I, 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 all this fun about my books and stuff is just, it's just an interesting sidebar. You can tell I'm passionate about Cordova. Um, the reason why I put this in here is because my publisher took the anatomy, uh, chapter two from my latest book and it's available free online. So if you want to see the Hello World 1, 2, 3, 4 that I did here but broken out and explained better, it's, there's a free PDF you can download and do it. And uh, my publisher has set up a, a discount code. So if you go to informit.com slash open source, you can get 37% off uh, using that code, outsource37. So I'm sorry, almost 40% off on a book. Actually, 40% off on multiple books is worth at least spending an hour with me, right? Um, I would pretend that this code is only good for this week, but I think it's good for the rest of the year. So. All right, <clears throat> and that's me. Uh, there's my Twitter handle.